Thank you for bearing with me this whole week. Uh, last Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and today. And uh, I too am pleased, but somewhat relieved, to be uh, giving this last of the, of the lectures, which, as you see, is devoted to the topic of the quality conundrum. A conundrum, as you know, is a riddle, an enigma, something that we can never quite figure out. So if you came here figuring that by the time we conclude this talk, you will know how to define and resolve issues of quality in translation and interpreting, I'm afraid you're in for a disappointment. But, c'est la vie. I come into this topic not so much as an academic, although that too. I come into this topic, first of all, as a practitioner. I'm a translator. I'm an interpreter. I'm also a teacher of translation and a teacher of interpreting. In all four of those capacities, I am constantly challenged and baffled by the notion of quality. And I constantly need to ask myself and to reevaluate, am I doing the job right? Are the students doing the job right? Is the person revising my translation doing his or her job right? Is it good? Is it good for whom? Is it appropriate for what it's intended for? As an editor, as someone who is edited, as an evaluator, and as someone who is evaluated, I am constantly confronted with this conundrum, and that perhaps is why I chose this topic. Uh, in order to prepare for the talk, I started out by looking at the literature, and I have at my disposal quite a lot of the literature in our field, and you know, taking a kind of cross-section of what has been written about quality. Well, life is too short to read everything that's been written about quality and translation. It is a massive amount. And I was quite overwhelmed by the sheer size of the pile of books and articles and references that I had in front of me. So I'd like to first run through a kind of literature review without getting too specific, but just to tell you the different angles or perspectives from which I saw quality being discussed in the literature. Any one of these, and I'm going to list maybe 25, any one of these could serve as the topic of a full lecture in itself and much more than that probably as the topic of several dissertations. Be that as it may, almost all of them start out by telling us that quality is an elusive subject, which basically means difficult to, to grasp, and end by telling us that they haven't quite figured it out. So it's the middle that I'm concerned about. Um, in James Holmes's map, translation quality is a part of you know, that sub-subsection dealing with translation criticism, which is essentially a branch of applied translation studies. And indeed, we see it discussed extensively within descriptive translation studies. And one of the first issues that is raised is, what is the theory of translation? And as uh, Juliana House, for example, tells us, evaluating the quality of a translation presupposes a theory of translation, which of course is true. You can't look, as, as Andrew Chesterman told us the other day, you can't really look at anything without having some kind of a theory about it and about how you're going to look, about, look at it. And uh, Juliana House goes on to say different views of translation lead to, lead to different concepts of translational theory and different ways of assessing it. I think that's self-evident, but it needs to be stated at, at the outset. So um, here are some of the angles, and I'm not going to discuss any of them. I'm just kind of going to mention them and then add a word or two um, before I get to the um, the examples I've chosen with, with which to illustrate the conundrum. First of all, is it descriptive or prescriptive? Uh, Andrew Chesterman tells us, and again, uh, rightly so, that discussions of quality always imply some prescriptivism. Quality is somehow, there's some hypothesis underlying it about what things should be or what will be more effective, more successful, etc. So many of the discussions are about the issue of whether to speak of quality in descriptive or prescriptive terms, or by the same token, many of the discussions are um, blatantly prescriptive. For example, this one, 
Um, yes, just a minute. No, this one. A recent report in an American newspaper tells us that President Nixon, accompanied by Mrs. Nixon in a flower dress, touched down at the airfield at the First Lady's attire, and I've italicized the keywords here, the First Lady's attire is evidently irrelevant here, and no doubt many non-English speakers would wonder why mention is made of it at all. Translators should, therefore, not hesitate to omit such sidetracking details. This is an illustration of what I mean by prescriptivism at its, uh, uh, the epitome thereof. You should not hesitate, do such and such. So many of the writings are either about whether we should be descriptive or prescriptive, or else many of the writings are in fact prescriptive, and many others are in fact descriptive. I'm going to focus more on the descriptive ones, which are more telling, as it were, but I wanted to mention that one could view quality, of course, from either one of those two angles. Then there's the massive amount of literature defining quality. What is quality? The definitions of quality in themselves could make a thick tome. Quality in terms of equivalence, functional equivalence, dynamic equivalence, uh, variability of equivalence, um, formal equivalence, syntactic equivalence, accuracy, fidelity, fluency, all these criteria and attempts at defining them so that they may serve as yardsticks or criteria of quality. And of course the definitions always tend to pull us in the direction of terms which only get us so far. Beyond that point, do you and I looking at this word really interpret it in the same way? And so we wind up in this kind of um, vicious circle of definitions and attempts to define the terms by which we're defining the other terms. Other discussions are by modality. Quality in interpreting, quality in translation, quality in dubbing, quality in subtitling, and any one of those could and indeed does, uh, could serve and indeed does serve as the basis of many research papers which, to my mind, do in fact have a practical application. They are applied, but they can also lead us to some theoretical insights. The discussions are often by producer, who produces the translation, human versus machine. I mentioned earlier uh, in an earlier talk, um, Evan Zohar's writings about his preference for machine translations at this point, and I even have in my handout an example of it. Quality of humans versus machines, and of course once we get into humans, there's a long list of novices as opposed to experienced. First language speakers, second language speakers. How does directionality affect quality? How does um, age affect quality? How does gender affect quality? All of those parameters are discussed. Every sentence I'm uttering now is covered in a long list of articles and or books. Sometimes the discussion is by setting. Uh, quality in community interpreting, quality in court interpreting, quality in uh, teaching and evaluating students, etc. Or by scopus. Um, I have in one of the slides that I'll show you in a minute a definition of translation quality one second. Um, yeah, here it is. This is in a list of instructions to translators who are translating software for the teaching of English. So of course when you're translating software that has a pedagogical purpose, the scopus is such that it defines what the quality should be. And so the instructions to the translators read as follows. Translation should be, and, and listen to the paradoxes, it's not so simple. Translation should be as close as possible to the English even if the translation seems slightly unnatural, but not to the point that the translation sounds strange. Okay, define unnatural, define strange. In cases where you would use different words because of cultural differences, translate, it, translate as it is in English, even if it seems odd. Okay, so these are instructions to translators of language teaching materials. That's an example of translation by Scopus, because it has a very specific reason why they want it to sound kind of literal. What else? Very often the discussion is about methodology. How do we evaluate quality? And then we go into articles about user expectation surveys, and articles about questionnaires, and how to construct them, and what to ask, and whom to ask, and how many counts as a valid survey and so on. 
And we also have questionnaires of user satisfaction. Okay, you've just heard the interpreting at this conference. What did you think? Was it good? Was it good? Was it fluent? Etc. Very often the discussion is a, an attempt to draw a kind of contrast between the declared position of the interpreter or translator themselves and their own actual self-evaluation or the evaluation by others. And often we find a gap between a declared position and an actual, actual practice. Sometimes the articles are about translation agencies and about what happens when the uh, work being done is handled by an agency, how that affects quality. This is the subject of a, a vast many articles, including several important ones by, by Anthony Fim. I just copied out something that Anthony wrote in 2004 uh, that indirectly relates to this. The sheer quantities of weekly authored material now being translated have brought about significant differences in the professional tasks. And here he starts talking about how many different things we actually do. And part of this particularly is when we work in a large organization or through an agency. Professional tasks of many trained mediators who are writing summaries, rewriting, providing linguistic consultation services, producing new text for new readers, post-editing, control trans post-editing control translations, managing language services. In such fields, the regulated replacement of natural language strings often has a priority lower than effectiveness and, effectiveness and timeliness. Um, in other words, timeliness, cost issues, how long it takes, etc., figure very strongly into discussions of quality in the context of business, of translation agencies. Then there are discussions of all the agents that are involved in the, um, in the act of translation. I'd like to read to you, just a moment, from a document that I will refer to late, later, which is called Translation Services Service Requirement, the European Standard EN 15034206, which has the status of a British standard. In short, it's the British standard for translation. And on page 17, we are told that this is a standard of translation, but it may also include the following added services. Listen to all the things that we do. Notarization, adaptation, rewriting, updating, localization, internationalization, globalization, terminology database creation, term-based management, transcription, transliteration, DTP, that's desktop publishing, graphic and web design, uh, technical writing, language and cultural consultancy, terminology concordance, translation memory alignment, alignment of bilingual parallel texts, pre-editing, post-editing, subtitling, voiceover, review and or revision of translations from third parties, and back translation. And this list is not exhaustive. So when you get into the issue of um, what translators really do, all of which, all of these, after all, have to be in some way assessed, um, the list becomes even more exhaustive. And then there are discussions, of course, of errors, error analysis, error categorization, binary versus non-binary, as Anthony wrote in 92, or uh, Andrew Chesterman, who writes about language errors versus translation errors. And the list of error typologies in itself could make an interesting topic for a meta translational presentation. Error typologies, what the errors tell us, which errors are more important than which ones and why, and how we assess them and so on. Then of course there are models of quality. Juliana House's model stands out in particular, covert versus overt translation, but there are several others, and they fill whole volumes. Um, the terminology of quality assessment. We had a, a class with Yves Gambier uh, a lecture with Yves Gambier about the meta-language of translation. Well, the meta-language of quality assessment in translation is a topic unto itself, and it too covers quite a, a lot of bibliography. A discussion of standards. What standards exist? What are the salient features of the standards? How are they enforced? This too is covered in the literature. For example, just a minute. 
some of the standards, such as the, uh, the DIA and the Deutsche Industrie Norm, Industry Norm, DIN 2345, which is primarily a description of the correct procedure that should be followed if you want reliable translations to result, or sometimes some of them are more in the line of an accreditation scheme. If you are capable of doing such and such, you get accredited and then you are a sworn translator or an accredited translator and then your translations are presumably good. Uh, sometimes the system is one of self-evaluation and sometimes there are random checks every three years or whatever to make sure. In short, um, standards is a very big topic and of course not only in the translation literature but as you see, in, in government, in organizations, and so on, standards are issued, and the whole discussion of how standards are formulated is a topic unto itself. Just a minute. And how can we mention standards without immediately also, without not immediately also mentioning ethics? Codes of ethics. What are the codes of ethics? How are they formulated? How are they enforced? Are they enforced? who's in charge of them, and codes of ethics are notoriously vague. They tend to have terminology like um, faithfully, fidelity, um, and so on. In other words, the words that, again, vague description. Um, or uh, one of the nicest attempts to formulate a code of ethics was uh, Andrew Chesterman's formulation of a a uh, hieronymic oath patterned on the Hippocratic Oath, which is basically a, a code of ethics for all translators, whatever type of translation they may do. It appeared in the translator, I think, number four, I'm not sure. The, the special issue devoted to ethics, actually. Um, and so codes of ethics are a big issue, particularly, I would say, in places like um, community interpreting and court interpreting and sign language interpreting, but also in other types of uh, translation and interpreting. And then what else do we have in the literature? Well, we have discussions of accreditation. For instance, uh, Ali Darwish, a uh, translation scholar in Australia, um, challenges the um, quality assurers, uh, to, uh, the way of certifying quali quality assurance people in the translation industry, those who are accredited by NATI, the National Accreditation Authority for Translators and Interpreters, and goes into a whole explanation about how quality assurance in translation could be ensured. You can find that, uh, could be uh, achieved. You could find that on, um, on, on Google. Um, Ali Darwish, he has a website and a lot of um, dis interesting discussions about quality. And, of course, how could I not mention norms? The discussion of norms, which I won't even begin to elaborate on how norms and quality go together, but obviously any discussion of quality cannot but lead us into a discussion of norms. If norms are the descriptive criterion par excellence of what we perceive to be a translation, or a good translation, if you wish, then, of course, discussions of norms somehow figure into this and a discussion of constraints. Yes, of course the translation wasn't good, there was noise. Yes, of course the subtitling let, left out a lot. You can't put everything into subtitling. So we have a lot of discussions of the constraints of the particular medium that we are evaluating. And there are elaborate discussions between practitioners and theorists, theoreticians. Uh, the example par excellence, which I highly recommend to anyone who hasn't already read it, is in the book uh, by Chesterman and Wagner. I have the title here somewhere, but I'm sure most of you 